Hello and welcome to the second lecture in the ongoing series of lectures on chemistry in everyday life. In the last lecture, we studied about preliminary information on drugs. We discussed differences between a drug and a medicine. We also discussed classification of drugs and how drugs are named. And then we moved on to how a drug can be selective uh, in its efficacy in a body. We discussed certain naturally occurring drugs and also uh, found out how to get the lead compound and then what is done on a lead compound through molecular modifications. This is all what we did in the first lecture. In today's lecture, what we are going to discuss is, is a continuation of where we left in the last lecture. Uh, we'll discuss types of drug action. Uh, we'll also discuss uh, biological response of drugs and information on drug targets. We'll spend a lot of time on the drug targets, uh, namely enzymes and receptors. Uh, we'll study drug receptor interactions or drug enzyme interactions. Uh, then we'll discuss drug protein interactions, uh, primarily those drug and receptor and drug and enzyme interactions, we'll study them in more details. Uh, and how a drug binds to a receptor or, uh, or an enzyme. So basically this whole lecture will talk about uh, the functioning and the mechanism of action of a drug vis-a-vis uh, -vis its uh, impact, its therapeutic impact. Okay? So let's move on with this uh, uh, drug interaction uh, and how drugs act. Drugs primarily act through either stimulating the system or depressing the system or then modifying or uh, you know modulating an immune response. They can also act as antimicrobial uh, uh, or antibacterial for that matter. They can act through uh, irritations. They can also act as cyt cytotoxic agents or they can act through a simple replacement. Now, whenever a drug uh, react on a body, uh, you must understand that most of the drugs uh, which we are primarily focusing on are very small molecules. They are small organic molecules of masses between uh, like 100 to 500 Daltons. There are certainly exceptions, uh, especially which are coming more and more up in uh, the coming years and you would see uh, that a lot of macromolecules would be uh, coming to market at drugs in the times to come. But so far, uh, primarily when we talk of a drug, we talk of a small molecule, uh, a small organic molecule of this size. Now, when a drug interact with a target and I told about a target in the last lecture as an epicenter which is responsible for a disease. Uh, due to its action, due to its interaction with that epicenter, which is called drug, it produces, which is called a target, it produces a biological response. All right. So then we need to understand both a target and a biological response. Right. So we'll first try to see what is a biological response. A biological response when a drug uh, interacts with a target or interacts with an epicenter of a disease is the behavior of a living organism which results from uh, use of that drug, right? So that is a biological response. This can be uh, classified in terms of effect and action, right? So a biological response is actually a mixture of an effect and an action. What do we mean by that? Let us try and understand. Action is how the drug would work uh, usually by enhancing or inhibiting a cell function, right? Because whenever a disease occurs, that disease occurs because of some abnormal enhancement of a function, of a cellular function, or on the other side, some uh, lowering down of the same cellular function or the other cellular function. So either the cellular machinery has become hyperactive or the cellular machinery has toned down in its effect, in its functioning, right? So that is an action. 
And then when the drug interacts with that particular epicenter or a target, the effect is the consequence of that drug re reacting or interacting on that uh, particular target and then change the course of that action, right? Now, there is an example, there is a, uh, you know, medicinal chemistry related example which I am going to discuss now. For example, aspirin, you take aspirin as an analgesic. Right? So, it alleviates pain and it alleviates fever. So, how would that act? Aspirin when it is taken inside the body, it tends to block prostaglandin synthesis. That is the action of the drug. Right? What is the effect of that action? Effect of that action is that a person suffering from pain will get relief, a person suffering from fever will get relief. So, both these terms action and effect are collectively fall under biological, uh, biological response. If I if I'll try to draw an anecdote here or an analogy here, let us assume that uh, traffic in a place is blocked, is jammed because of let's say there is a car which is wrongly parked, right? So, jamming of a traffic is actually a disease. Right? It can be construed as a disease and it is because of that wrongly parked car. So, that wrongly parked car is actually the epicenter, the genesis of that disease, right? So, which can be actually construed as a target. Now, how you would alleviate it? You need to probably look for a driver. That driver must occupy and, uh, you know, occupy the driver's seat in that car and try to correct the course, try to park it at the right place place. Now, that driver is nothing but a drug. So, drivers taking a seat on the, uh, you know, in that car is an action. Whereas, once he parks, he or she parks the car in the right position, in the right parking slot, that is the effect because uh, as a result of that effect, the person, uh, the, the jam will be completely removed, the person will be uh, completely uh, cured from the disease. Right? So, this is what we mean by biological response. So, now it is important that we discuss the first part which is drug target. What is this epicenter I have been talking about right? in the last lecture and in this lecture as well. So, this epicenter or a drug target is anything within a living organism to which a drug is directed or a drug binds to it resulting in a change in its behavior or function. Whose behavior or function? Drug targets behavior or function because it is the malfunctioning of that particular target which is causing a disease. So, that needs to correct and that will be corrected only when a drug will bind to that particular target. Right? So, it is as simple as that. When we talk about drug target, most of the drug targets uh, we encounter are actually proteins and I hope you are all aware of what proteins are. That has already been taught to you in other series of lectures. Proteins constitute enzymes, they constitute receptors, they constitute transporters, ion channels and cytoskeletal proteins. So, all of these are the drug targets primarily which are actually proteinaceous in nature. Apart from proteins, other drug targets might be DNAs or RNAs which are uh, nucleic acids or in some cases a drug target can actually be a lipid membrane which is a cellular membrane. A cellular membrane constitutes uh, is consist of uh, uh, lipid bilayer, uh, all of you are aware of that. So, that lipid bilayer also can sometime act as a drug target. And sometime it can be miscellaneous in very rare circumstances, uh, the, the disease might have caused due to uh, certain metabolites, certain bone matrices and certain physiochemical substrates. Now, if we look at this, uh, this pi diagram here, you can easily see the present situation as far as drugs and the targets are concerned. You would note that around 36 percent here and 38 percent here are actually 
the targets which are proteinaceous. G protein coupled receptors, they are very specialized, super specialized class of receptors, which had been, uh, you know, not quite recently found out. And within a very short period of span, they have become the major target of interest as they have been found to be the root cause of many of the diseases. So, around 36 percent of the diseases uh, stem through some malfunctioning of G protein coupled receptors. About another 38 percent of the diseases are attributed to malfunctioning of enzymes, which are also proteinaceous nature. Then you have ionotropic receptors, kinase related receptors, so another 9 and 9 percent here. So, almost 80 percent or more than 80 percent of the drug uh, of the diseases they are caused by some malfunctioning in the proteins, whether it is receptors or it is uh, enzymes or then uh, you know certain uh, these kind of uh, ionotropic uh, or ion channels and all. So, considering this, we have figured out that most of the protein particles, uh, you know, the kind of ion channels or enzymes or transporters or receptors are root causes of diseases. And also amongst them, we have seen primarily enzymes and receptors constitute majority of diseases and they are the ones where uh, the drug must act. So, for the rest of this discussion, for rest of this uh, uh, lecture today, we will focus our studies, we will focus our discussion on enzymes and receptors and how drugs behave with enzymes and receptors. Before that, we should understand enzymes and receptors and their functioning uh, and I will give you a little bit amount of information on that very quickly. So, first about enzymes you probably are aware that enzymes are your body's, your cells catalysts, right? So, cell requires catalyst. If it would not require a catalyst, things would never have moved the rate they move uh, with, right? For example, just to demonstrate this, I will give you again uh, a certain analogy and that analogy is, uh, if you for example, if you keep a bottle of sugar, right? that is found in the kitchen cabinets in almost every household. How long can that bottle store a sugar without disturbing? Maybe several months, maybe several years and nothing happens to that sugar, right? But as soon as that sugar is taken inside the body, that sugar changes. It changes to corresponding glucose molecules. Those glucose molecules then provide ATP in no time, carbon dioxide is generated and water is generated and everything is done, right? So, why uh, inside the body the reaction is so fast that a sugar is consumed within a matter of minutes, whereas even if you dissolve sugar in water and keep it uh, outside, nothing will happen to it. Sugar will remain as sugar, right? this is the impact of enzymes, this is the impact of body's catalysts. So, what catalysts do, what these enzymes do, uh, this is shown in this diagram. An enzyme would have these kind of ridges or grooves, right? And these grooves are called active sites of an enzyme. On these active sites, the substrates which are to be acted upon, they will come and they will sit and find out a place in the active site, right? Now, based upon the way they fit onto this, uh, onto this enzyme pocket, there are two theories. One theory is an outdated theory, which is a lock key hypothesis, which says that an drugs, uh, an enzyme's active site is just like a lock. It's rigid, it does not change and a substrate is also like a key, it also does not change but they are so designed, this, this active site is so designed and substrate is so designed that both of them are complementary to each other, hence just like a lock and a key. The other theory which is more relevant and which is actually the accurate one is induced fit theory. And this induced fit theory says that whenever a substrate comes on this, the surface of an enzyme, the enzyme's binding site it slowly or this active site starts to interact with the substrate and upon interaction with the substrate, this 
binding site or active site of the enzyme it starts to change shape in such a manner that it becomes a very good fit for this substrate. In the process substrate does not remain in an ideal geometry or ideal conformation it might become strained it might become ideally fitted for a particular reaction and as a result of which uh, the substrate very easily gets reacted in this particular example it has been cleaved at this end right and it gives you the product here. Once a product forms it no longer is able to fit into this groove it comes out and the enzyme also restores back to its previous conformation that is an induced fit hypothesis. So, in place of substrate here uh, you can also uh, see the same effect with a drug molecule. A drug molecule can also be a substrate for an enzyme right which is an uh, kind of not a natural substrate for an enzyme it is a man made substrate for an enzyme. Now this was about enzymes so what about receptor? Well receptor is also a protein molecule as I told you it is a macromolecule it is a protein molecule polypeptide molecule and it is present on the surface of the cell surface of the cellular membrane. Now why would you require proteinaceous materials on the surface of a cellular membrane? Let me give you an example and you would tend to realize and appreciate why it is so, uh, so pressive that we should have a receptor on the cellular surface. Let us consider your heart cells right the muscle cells of heart there are you know thousands of muscle cells which uh, in the heart which need to contract and dilate exactly at the same time right. If they do not dilate and contract at the same time heart will be just a mess right. Now how would every cell know that it has to contract just now and relax you know let us say half a second later. This happens and this can only happen if all the cells living in a close vicinity will get some sort of a messenger some sort of a mail right some sort of a postman which will intimate all the cells at one time that okay look this is the time you will contract this is the time you will all uh, you know relax. This uh, simple this postman is nothing but a messenger molecule. Messenger molecules can be in the in the form of neurotransmitters they can come from nerves or these messenger molecules can also be in the form of hormones right. So, for example, when somebody sees uh, a danger outside so then immediately a hormone from uh, uh, you know uh, medulla oblongata it is released and that hormone is adrenaline and then that adrenaline uh, reaches the cells and it tells the heart to pump faster all the molecules they start to pump faster at one time right. So, that is the postman the postman is adrenaline and then the modulator for this is uh, that part of the brain which is actually controlling this whole activity. So, the point I am trying to make is cell needs to survive in its surrounding. So, in order to interact in order to survive in the surrounding it needs to interact with its uh, neighborhood right and it requires these kind of messenger molecules through which it interacts and uh, uh, you know uh, it does the functions. Uh, with uh, alongside with the neighborhood cells right. So, then for this purpose you need those messenger molecules and those messenger molecules then are received by what we call our receptors. So, this is a reason why a receptors are present on a cellular surface. So, they receive the messenger molecules and act accordingly. Again as far as functioning of receptors is concerned it is similar to what we saw in the case of enzymes. A messenger molecule look at here would approach a receptor and as soon as it fits into the groove of a receptor look at the change in receptor geometry right. So, we are talking about an induced fit here the same way as we talked about in case of enzymes and once the effect is generated once uh, whatever receptor had to do it has done then this messenger molecule will leave the receptor 
right? The only difference between a receptor and an enzyme is that unlike an enzyme, a receptor molecule does not undergo a reaction. It only sends a message to the cell to act accordingly. Whatever the messenger molecule has told the cell to do, it tells to the receptor and receptor communicates that information to the cell to act accordingly, right? Now, how would a receptor tell the cell and what it will do to make the cell work accordingly, accordingly to the function, to the message it has received through the messenger molecules? There are two ways in which a receptor can act. A receptor can act through modulating what we call ion channels or it can also modulate membrane bound enzymes, right? So, let us look at how a receptor can modulate an ion channel. Uh, I hope you are all aware of ion channels. If not, then ion channels are kind of these kind of transverse proteins which uh, sit across the cellular membrane, right? So, since these, these are proteins and this kind of inner surface is quite polar, they are able to uh, facilitate movement of ions within the cell and within the cell to outside the cell or from outside the cell to within the cell. So, they uh, facilitate movement of ion across the cellular membrane and that is very important for a plethora of activities of cell. For example, every nerve response is basically polarization and depolarization process in which uh, you know this kind of uh, 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 removing of certain ions or coming out of coming in of certain ions is a crucial activity, right? So, let us say a receptor has received a response, there is a messenger molecule, it has reached a receptor and this receptor is just present at the ion channel in such a way that it is acting just like a gate of the ion channel, right? So, in this, it, in its native conformation, in its relaxed conformation, it is manning the gate, it is not allowing any uh, interaction of the ions from outside to inside or from inside to outside, right? Now, as soon as the messenger molecule comes in and it fits into the receptor, because of the induced fit mechanism, receptor changes a shape and because it changes its shape, there is a corresponding change in the ion channel uh, gate and this gate opens up. And the moment it opens up, it facilitates movement of ions and then the simple signal which it received gets multiplied many folds because one molecule, one messenger molecule becomes responsible for exchange of let us say thousands of ions in a flash of time, right? So, that is how let us say if this is the effect uh, of a cell uh, was entitled to bring, then the cell will bring this particular effect. Right? The second one I mentioned here was uh, membrane bound enzymes. So, just like ion channel, sometimes these receptors once they receive a messenger, they change the shape and because they change their shape, their changing shape can also influence certain enzymes inside the cell to perform to activate or get deactivated. Right? So, that is another way how a receptor molecule can function. So, as I told you, drugs will primarily react with either receptors or enzymes. So, after having seen how these enzymes and how these uh, receptors, uh, they behave with uh, their corresponding substrates or messenger molecules, it is important now to understand what a drug will do to them, right? But before we know that, we also should understand since these are proteinaceous in nature, both receptors and enzymes, we should also know their configuration so that it will make us easy to predict how a drug will react or interact with, uh, with them, whether it is receptors or, or enzymes. So, again all of you know this fact very well, an enzyme or a receptor or any protein for that matter is a polypeptide. And these polypeptides, they do not just stay like that, they orient in what we call as secondary structures. These secondary structures could be alpha helix or these could be beta pleated sheets, right? 
So now, based upon uh, the secondary structure, they become further twined or intertwined and become very complex three-dimensional molecules. And those three-dimensional molecules are actually give a protein its particular shape, whether it's fibr fibrillus, whether it's globular or whatever. Right? So, this three-dimensional structure is uh, because of uh, intertwining and mixing of all those secondary structures inside, inside as you could see here. Now, we should understand and I think you know that why this tertiary structure is stable or it is, it acquires the shape uh, it finally acquires. Uh, and that is because of these type of secondary interactions between the residues of uh, these polypeptide chains. So, these secondary interactions could be ionic interactions like here, these secondary interactions could be covalent interactions like here between sulfur-sulfur, these secondary interactions could be hydrophobic interactions and these secondary interactions could be hydrogen bond interactions. All of these interactions are quite feeble. Uh, barring maybe ionic interactions and uh, covalent interactions, but nevertheless these interactions play a major role uh, in order to stabilize a three-dimensional structure of a protein particle, right? Well, sometimes a protein is constituted not by a single polypeptide, it is constituted by two or more than two polypeptides. In that case, both the polypeptide acquires their corresponding three-dimensional shape and then they mix together and they give a quaternary structure to a particular protein, right? So, in this case, for example, the upper half is one polypeptide alpha chain and the lower half is another polypeptide chain which is beta chain, right? So now, knowing the structure of a protein, we now should understand how a drug is going to interact with a particular protein. In order to understand that, we should again go back and try to understand a few terms. The first term is about the targets and I have repeatedly told them that they, uh, told you that these targets are actually macromolecules, they are proteinaceous in nature mostly and the examples we are following are uh, receptors and enzymes. Now, a drug is supposed to interact with its target, whether it is a receptor or it is an enzyme by binding to its binding site. Now, I spoke about when I was talking about the enzymes or I was talking about receptors, I was showing you those grooves, right? And those grooves are nothing but they are the binding sites. They have the required uh, conformation in which a drug molecule uh, can actually interact with that particular target. Binding sites are typically hydrophobic pockets on the surface of macromolecules. Now, that is an important aspect. A binding site that group I spoke about are generally hydrophobic. Now, why should nature made binding sites hydrophobic? The simple, uh, uh, you know, the simple reason for this is probably to keep water away. You must understand that a protein molecule, whether it is a receptor or an enzyme, is thriving in an aqueous environment all the time, right? But then aqueous environment is not good for reactions. Let us say an enzyme has to undergo a nucleophilic uh, or facilitate a nucleophilic reaction, then water molecules can actually act as, an, uh, as, a, as a nucleophile in that reaction, right? So, it would not require water molecule within its active sites. So, in order to keep water away, generally these binding sites are housed or these are flanked by hydrophobic residues and those hydrophobic residues since these are water repelling, they would not let water come inside the binding pocket so that the molecules can easily uh, find a place inside the cavity and they can react and bind uh, with the target. Binding interactions typically involve intermolecular bonds and these interactions we will see in a short while. How a drug molecule interacts with that binding site in a target, okay? Binding groups are the functional groups on the drug which involved in binding interaction. So, corresponding to binding site, there are binding groups in a drug. So, there is an interaction between a binding group and a binding site. 
So these binding sites and binding groups should be complementary to each other, right? Only then a drug molecule can fit well into the binding site. These binding regions are specific regions within the binding site that are involved in binding interaction. And then most of the drugs are actually in equilibrium between being bound and unbound to the target. So that's actually a case where, uh, you know, every time this is an equilibrium process. So every time a drug molecule tends to bind to a particular target, uh, unless it is binding uh, in an uh, irreversible manner, you will always find that there is some concentration of unbound drug and there is some concentration of a bound drug. Let us understand this fact now in some more details. So when we speak about uh, intermolecular bonding forces, the kind of forces which keep a drug bound to a particular receptor or an enzyme. We talk about the uh, intermolecular forces as electrostatic or ionic forces. We talk about hydrogen bonding forces. We talk about van der Waal forces. We talk about dipole-dipole interactions or other induced dipole interactions. Now in the following slides, uh, I'll try to explain these uh, in little bit of further details. For example, electrostatic or ionic forces. Now, <laughs> with every such uh, interaction, there is a corresponding diagram here to make, uh, uh, you know, this whole thing simpler uh, to understand. Now, for ionic force, if you look at this particular figure here, there is a target and this target is proteinaceous in nature. Now, one of the residues of the target at the binding site has a free amine and this amine is protonated. So, this protonated amine can certainly engage in ionic interaction with let's say some functionality on a drug if that functionality happens to be ionic of different polarity. So in this case here it is a carboxylate group. So a carboxylate group and a protonated amine can engage in some sort of an ionic bond. So these interactions are quite strong. They take place between groups of opposite charges. The strength of ionic interaction is inversely proportional to distance between the two charged groups. Stronger interactions occur in hydrophobic environments. This, this is the fact I told you in the previous slide. And ionic bonds are most important initial interactions as the drug enters the binding site. So once a drug approaches a binding site, the first interactions to take place are generally ionic in nature. Okay? Let's move on to the second one here. The second one is hydrogen bonding. They are not so strong in strength in comparison to ionic strength, although these are very important uh, interactions taking place uh, between the binding site and the binding groups of a drug. A hydrogen bond, as you all know, can take place between an electron deficient hydrogen and an electron rich heteroatom. That heteroatom could be nitrogen or oxygen. The electron deficient hydrogen is attached to a heteroatom and this electron deficient hydrogen is generally called a hydrogen bond donor whereas an electron rich heteroatom which tries to attract this hydrogen is called hydrogen bond acceptor. So in this diagram you could see an image in which the target which can be a receptor or an, or an enzyme contains an electron rich heteroatom. It could be nitrogen, it could be oxygen. So, for example, if it's a serine residue, you could consider that it contains oxygen with a lone pair, right? Likewise, if a drug contains, let's say, a hydrogen which is attached to an electronegative heteroatom and there is a stress on the electrons, this hydrogen can very easily uh, st start to engage bond formation with this uh, nucleophilic uh, Y group, which is electron rich, for, uh, giving you formation of a hydrogen bond. So, in this case, this is hydrogen bond donor and target is a hydrogen bond acceptor. It can be vice versa, wherein target can be hydrogen bond donor and your drug can be hydrogen bond acceptor. Then we move on to van der Waal interactions. These are actually very feeble interactions. Uh, very small energy is uh, released as a result of this interaction. And this occurs between hydrophobic regions of drug and target. Basically, van der Waal forces are hydrophobic interactions. And how do they happen? They happen uh, the way it can be shown here. 
as and when a drug molecule enters the binding pocket there are certain pockets of that drug there are certain regions of that drug which are hydrophobic likewise you might find complementary uh, hydrophobic regions in the binding site now once they come uh, in close proximity there are certain polarizations right and because of those polarizations there are small dipoles which are generated and then unlike dipoles they will attract each other and this result into some sort of very feeble interaction and these interactions are called van der Waal interactions right so these interactions are because of transient dipoles on the drugs and this results in formation of what we call van der Waal interactions these interactions are very feeble they have very small energy of stabilization but at the same time they are amongst the most important interactions you will encounter between a drug and its binding site okay and lastly there are these dipole dipole interactions let's assume that the binding pocket the binding site of a target actually contains a permanent dipole moment and likewise you also have a substrate or a drug molecule which contains a permanent dipole moment then there is always a chance of interaction between the two uh, uh, due to dipole dipole interactions and there is this kind of uh, uh, stabilization which occurs so it will change conformation it will orient in a way uh, to maximize this interaction here resulting in formation of this dipole dipole um, bonds so now after discussing all of that let me just revise uh, what we studied in this drug binding to a particular target so what we saw here is uh, a drug target as a receptor or an enzyme a macromolecule which contains certain regions certain hydrophobic regions and these hydrophobic regions or groups are called the binding sites then the, in this binding site a drug molecule will approach and comes in close proximity eventually there would be some drug molecules which will find a way to enter this groove and bind with that a uh, particular active site and some will remain in an unbound uh, uh, manner or unbound state there is an equilibrium between the two states at any given time right if i zoom into this portion what i get i find that uh, within this groove where drug is settling down and it is interacting with this binding site i would note and i would see that there are certain red regions called binding regions in the uh, protein part and you also have corresponding binding groups on the drug so when you have a complementarity complementarity achieved here between the two this would result in certain intermolecular bonds these intermolecular bonds could be very feeble as van der Waal bonds these could be very strong as covalent bonds or ionic bonds or could be of an average kind average strength like hydrogen bonds so based upon every such bond formed there is a stabilization right because there is energy released there is a corresponding stabilization achieved in, for this structure right and that's how a drug is going to bind to a particular receptor uh, this is what will happen here and i'm going to now describe a binding site in a little bit more realistic purview to you so this is an active site or a binding site of a uh, let's say a receptor or an enzyme a target right okay a, a proteinaceous target so what are you seeing here you are seeing that this active site this groove is flanked by certain residues there is a residue number 195 there is a residue number 171 109 140 101 and 53 what do these numbers signify these numbers signify the order of their uh, uh, you know their amino acid residue so this is 195th amino acid this is 171st amino acid in that polypeptide chain okay if you count that polypeptide chain let's say from n terminal to c terminal this will come at 195th position this will come at 171 position at 19 109 position this also tells you why three dimensional tertiary structure is very important simply because 
had it not been for tertiary structure or that intertwining you would not see 171st group in close proximity to 195th group and then that would not have uh, very effectively created an active site so that is why this intertwining and this mixing of secondary structure to give tertiary structure is very important okay now what else you see the other thing to note here is some of the residues are actually quite polar they can they are also susceptible to engage in hydro uh, engage in ionic interactions for example this residue aspartic acid so it can engage in ionic interactions there would be a negative charge here likewise certain uh, uh, groups like arginine here can result in let's say hydrogen bond interactions and here also you have histidine which can engage in hydrogen bond interactions also and in this binding pocket we do not see any group here which can uh, actually undergo van der Waal interaction right but uh, the same thing can happen there might, there might be certain groups let's say phenylalanine uh, if let's say phenylalanine is here it will engage in uh, hydrophobic interactions or van der Waal interactions with the drug or any substrate right so that's how an active site of an enzyme is made or designed right or is uh, it stays there now i'm giving you an example a hypothetical example of a substrate binding right so looking at a substrate you can probably foresee what type of active uh, binding site or an active site should look like in that particular enzyme or a receptor here i am talking about a molecule called pyruvic acid which is uh, converted into lactic acid using an enzyme lactic dehydrogenase lactic acid dehydrogenase now if you look at this pyruvic acid you would note that it contains this region which is amenable to van der Waal interactions it contains this region which is amenable to hydrogen bond interactions and it contains this region which is amenable to ionic bond interactions so if we have to kind of draw or figure out what type of active site would be available for this molecule we can probably see that if this molecule sits in an active site like this there should be a hydrogen bond susceptible residue here hydrophobic susceptible residue here and ionic uh, bond susceptible forming sus uh, residue here so you should have a lysine here you can have phenylalanine here you can have serine here right so this kind of understanding is extremely important for a medicinal chemist in order to understand how a drug will behave uh, inside the active moiety right so and this also explains the induced fit mechanism let's say once this molecule sits here this serine residue was placed somewhere here so because of these two interactions uh, the molecule is able to find a way and sits here but the moment it sits here this serine residue will also start to change shape a little bit try to come closer to this oxygen here so that it can engage in hydrogen bonds so this is how an enzyme active site is very dynamic uh, and it changes shape right now so far we studied how an enzyme and receptors will bind to a particular drug molecule now in the last portion of this discussion let me tell you about the effect which this type of binding will uh, bring about so let us look at the effect on a receptor right what happens to a receptor when uh, a drug molecule reacts on a receptor so you must understand that under a pathological condition under a diseased condition a receptor has either become overheated it means there are too many messengers which are actually acting which are hitting that receptor or at the same time this receptor might have become sluggish so it means the number of receptors are less based upon that a drug can actually act as an antagonist or an agonist okay what do we mean by that if a drug is acting as an agonist then it means it is binding to the receptor and activating that receptor to produce a biological response so it is kind of uh, you know uh, replacing the substrate replacing the messengers and trying to fill the gap 
since there are less messengers, it is trying to fill the gap and making this enzyme, making this receptor function even better, right? This is an agonistic uh, reaction. An antagonistic effect is when a drug binds to a receptor, but it does not activate, rather it blocks the activity of the agonist. So, what happens is once an ag antagonist comes here, it binds to the uh, receptor, it blocks that receptor for any other messenger to come. So, if there is an hyperactivity here, then blocking of the particular receptor will try to cool down uh, that particular uh, receptor and its effect, all right. When we talk about enzymes and effects of drugs on enzyme, we generally talk about the effect of enzyme in these three uh, forms. It is a competitive inhibition caused by drugs or it is non-competitive inhibition caused by drugs or it can be allosteric inhibition. Let us try to understand uh, all the three one by one. What we mean by competitive inhibition is, let us say there is an enzyme and it has a natural substrate here, right? Now, if you give a lot of drug, if you give drug molecules in and those drug molecules come in the vicinity of that enzyme, they start to competitively uh, replace this substrate, okay. So, if based upon concentrations, if concentration of drug is more, you will see that more and more substrate will be displaced and in its place drug molecule will fit into enzyme. As the drug fits into enzyme, it is no longer able to uh, act on this substrate and bring about the required reaction. So, this is about competitive inhibition and I am going to give you a very uh, good example and that example is toxicity caused by ethylene glycol or antifreeze. So, if an antifreeze, if a person has somehow mistakenly consumed uh, ethylene glycol, that ethylene glycol uh, actually acts upon this enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase and finally, through series of reactions, it produces oxalic acid. That oxalic acid is actually not good for the body, is, is extremely toxic. So, you know, this what we want is that this ethylene glycol should not uh, act, should not bind to this enzyme here, right? It means we need to find some sort of a mimic of ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol in this case can be construed as a substrate, and we need to provide in a drug and that drug should displace this ethylene glycol. You know what the drug is? That drug is nothing but alcohol, okay? So, if the person, if the patient is given alcohol in high concentrations, so that alcohol will start to compete with this ethylene glycol and uh, more often than not, it will be this alcohol which will eventually bind to this ADH and then get the required effect whereas ethylene glycol does not find an opportunity to bind to this enzyme and then toxicities are certainly alleviated. So, this is about competitive inhibitor. There is a competition between a substrate and the drug molecule, okay, for a particular effect to be produced. There are also drugs of the kind of non-competitive nature. So, when we talk of non-competitive nature, it is shown here the drug molecule comes in and fits to the active site, but then the drug molecule engages in a covalent bond with one of the active, one of the residues in the active site. In this case, there is a nucleophilic substitution reaction here between this chloro and this hydroxy group uh, resulting in formation of a covalent bond here. And once a covalent bond establishes, this enzyme is permanently frozen. Right? So, once it is permanently frozen, there is no competition, that enzyme is completely gone. And most of the deadly poisons, for example, nerve gas, for example, antibiotics in for bacteria, for example, penicillin, you know, they all act through non-competitive inhibitor. You must understand that for 1 lakh of, let us say 1 lakh of substrate molecules, there are maybe 10 or 15 enzyme molecules, right? since enzyme is a catalyst and you require catalysts in very small amount. So, if you bring in a drug molecule which is able to completely block the enzyme permanently, so it will destroy the enzyme forever and those 10 or 15 molecules destroyed in no time can kill the organism, okay, or kill the animal or kill the mammal uh, uh, wherever it is applied. There is another type of 
uh, inhibition also which is called non competitive reversible inhibition. In this case the drug molecule does not bind to the same site where the substrate binds. It finds another site and this, an, this other site is called allosteric site. So, it finds its way to an allosteric site, but what happens is because the moment it binds to an allosteric site due to the phenomena of induced fit, there is a conformational change in the active site also and this active site is no longer able to receive this substrate. This is a body's natural phenomena against what we call a feedback inhibition. Let us say uh, the body, the cell wanted to produce uh, a, a particular molecule, a particular metabolite, okay? let us say a fatty acid. So, once lot of fatty acid has been produced, then some of the final products will find a way and gets into an allosteric site of an enzyme, so that uh, the enzyme no longer is able to produce any further. Uh, fatty acids. So, the same phenomena is being trapped for uh, biomedicinal chemists uh, for this drug reaction also. So, with this what we studied today is in nutshell uh, for uh, the drug interaction with the protein particles and in protein particles I told you the major targets were receptors and enzymes and we discussed how drug molecules bind to receptors, how they bind to uh, enzymes and what kind of effects uh, these bindings would actually produce. Uh, so, basically what we have covered in today's lecture is mode of action of most of the drugs. Okay? So, a general mode of action of drugs uh, due to their uh, ability to interact with those epicenters called targets. So, next time when we will meet uh, I will take you to uh, you know different topics wherein we will discuss medicinal applications of drugs, wherein we will talk about certain diseases and based upon the knowledge we have accrued so far, we will discuss and describe how those drugs uh, bring about antibiotic effects, how these drugs bring about their antacid effects, how these drugs bring about their analgesic effects or how these drugs bring about antipsychotic effects. So, I hope uh, today's lecture was uh, uh, interesting for you and I hope to see you again uh, in the third lecture in this series. Thank you very much for uh, you know spending time with me here. Thank you.